Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name's Carl and it's good to have you with us. This week we're looking at the third and final occasion on which Jesus had predicted his death and resurrection and what followed in the immediate aftermath of that. Before we dive into that, however, if you haven't done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study, the link for which is just below the video in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of the reading we're going to be looking at today, some other passages you may find it helpful to look up, the questions that we'll ponder together towards the end, and lots of space to record your own thoughts and observations. So without further ado, let's dive into today's reading, which comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Jesus and his disciples were continuing on their journey towards Jerusalem, as we learnt in verse 32. And Jesus had just made the third of three statements that he makes in Mark's Gospel about the Son of Man needing to suffer and die before rising again later, verses 33 to 34. And he made that statement in the face of what verse 32 tells us was the fear of his disciples. The passage that we're looking at today shows Jesus in the dialogue with his disciples that came out of that, as they once again failed to grasp what was required of them if they wanted to follow him. So it's useful to keep in mind chapter 8 verses 31 to 33 and chapter 9 verses 30 to 35 where we see the two previous failures of the disciples to understand where all this was going. So who have we got in this passage then? Well most obviously we've got Jesus heading towards Jerusalem and very sure what of his vocation as Israel's Messiah was going to demand of him. We've also got James and John, who, as we learnt in chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, were brothers, sons of Zebedee, who were amongst the first four disciples to be called by Jesus as he walked around Galilee. They were from a fishing background, and like Peter, they formed part of Jesus' most intimate inner circle. And James and John, along with Peter, were two out of the three witnesses to see the transfiguration, as we saw in chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. And we know that the wider body of disciples continued to be with Jesus, including, but not limited to, the twelve. Though it's the twelve that Jesus seems to focus on here, as they all continue their journey along the road. And we know that Mark's Gospel was the first to be written around 65 to 70 of the Common Era, but it's worth noting that there were a couple of later parallel versions of this story. So we've got Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, which gives us a very clear parallel telling of all of this. But we've also got Luke 22, verses 24 to 27, which is kind of a partial echo. It picks up on the latter stuff in this passage. Now, despite the teaching that they'd received already about welcoming the kingdom of God as they would welcome a little child, we saw in chapter 9, verses 36 to 37, and Jesus scolding his disciples in chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, for trying to keep children away from him, it seems that James and John were still focused on status and power. And we're told in verse 35 that they approach Jesus and ask him to do whatever they asked of him. And that led him to in turn say, well, what do you want from me? In verse 36. And we might think of an echo of that in chapter 10, verse 51. So I'm looking slightly ahead to next week's passage when Jesus interacts with Bartimaeus. Now, it seems that they just haven't got their heads round what Jesus coming into his glory was actually going to mean. 
There's reference to that in chapter 8, verse 28, and later in chapter 13, verse 26. So it's a key theme. But James and John, it seems, have missed the point. And we know in chapter 9, verse 10, that the disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant when he talked about rising again. Instead of the path that Jesus was taking that would lead to his self-emptying and death, it seems that James and John imagined status and power and perhaps ruling in opulence and they wanted the two positions of greatest status and power at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus respectively. They wanted the places of honour. Now when we look at Matthew's slightly later version of this in chapter 20 verses 20 and 21, it's James and John's mother who asks for preferential treatment on behalf of her sons. But in Mark, the blame is placed squarely on their shoulders alone. Now Jesus, in response to all of this, turns their attention back towards what's coming as they head to Jerusalem. And he says, can you really drink the cup of suffering that I'm going to have to drink? Thinking perhaps of Isaiah 51 verses 17 to 22 or Psalm 75, verse 8. And note he himself would ask for this cup to be taken away in Gethsemane, as chapter 14, verse 36 shows us. And moreover, could they be baptised with the baptism that Jesus would receive himself? Now this reference to baptism at this point isn't really clear, and there's a great deal of speculation on what it means. But it could relate to being overwhelmed by waters or troubles, picking up perhaps on the imagery of Isaiah 43, verse 2. Or it could allude to what Paul says in Romans 6 about being baptised into Jesus' death in order to share in his resurrection. Now, as the first part of verse 39 shows us, James and John insist that they can indeed drink the cup of suffering and share in the same baptism. But it's clear that they still really haven't grasped what this all means. And perhaps they were thinking back to the Transfiguration at this point and thinking of themselves still being like sort of Moses and Elijah on the right and the left hand sides of, of, of Jesus. But in the end, as we learn in chapter 15, verse 27, it wouldn't be James and John who were either side of Jesus when he was honoured. It would be the two bandits, the two criminals who were crucified either side of him, who were there at that moment when the fullness of God's love, God's glory was revealed, indeed at the point where Jesus expresses God forsakenness. Now, Jesus goes on to say, you will indeed have a share in these things. And perhaps what we see there is Mark looking ahead to the fate of at least James, who was killed by Herod Agrippa in the year 44 for his role in the Jerusalem church. We see in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. So what Jesus says at the latter part of verse 39 does indeed come to pass. But as he goes on to say in verse 40, the positions of honour at his right and left are not for him to um, grant. Instead, that's for God the Father to do. Now, perhaps predictably, when they learn of this discussion between Jesus, James and John, the other members of the twelve get angry, as we learn in verse 41. And so Jesus begins once again teaching them privately, following the pattern he has done all the way through this gospel from explaining his parables onwards. So he draws a contrast between the kingdom of God and the earthly rulers we're told in verse 42 that the disciples would recognise around them, whose relationships followed a model of kind of patron-client um, relating, in which rank very much rested in hierarchy, and rulers would expect to be served and be able to make demands. And it's interesting that this passage begins with James and John making a demand of their own. Now the term lord it over that Jesus uses in relation to these Gentile rulers that the disciples may have recognised can be a neutral term 
as in Genesis 1.28, sort of the idea of having dominion. But it may reflect violent behaviour, such as we see in Numbers 21.24 or chapter 32, verse 22. And further, and I think perhaps most likely, it can reflect behaviour that takes advantage of others, as we see in Psalm 19, verse 13. And when Jesus talks about ruling like tyrants, it definitely suggests the latter, maybe with a mix of the second aspect about violence. I certainly don't think it's a neutral term in this case. Now, Jesus takes his turning of these ideas about power and status and greatness upside down a step further by talking in verse 43 about diaconus, which means servant, but also about doulos, which means slave. So Jesus is once again carrying on the theme he's introduced in chapter 1, verse 22, and chapter 2, verses 7 and 10. But these are among the starkest claims that we've got. See, being a servant was an honourable kind of position, but being a slave, being doulos, was not at all. It was the lowest of the low, the bottom of the rung, you had no status, no rights, no value in the eyes of the wider world. There was no honour or reward to be had in being the slave of all. And yet Jesus, in verse 43, uses this powerful, powerful language. And it goes on in verse 45 to talk about Jesus giving his life as a ransom for many. Now, this is a very famous phrase, and some have argued that it picks up on the idea of substitutionary atonement that we might draw on the suffering servant songs of Isaiah 53, for instance, to, to validate. And the idea that what Jesus is saying is that he's going to take on himself all of the sin of the world and its impact, um, bearing the punishment so that we don't have to. But others, have read this differently and say, well, it's not necessarily about substitutionary atonement. Perhaps it links to what St. Paul talks about in his beautiful poem in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, about Jesus not taking equality with God as something to be grasped and held onto and kept as a private possession, but instead becoming the servant, the slave of all, self-emptying and giving his life to set all creation free. So that as Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. Perhaps that's more the sense of ransom. But indeed, others have argued for an understanding called Christus Victor that was quite prominent in the early church before penal substitution kind of became the principal evangelical theory in inverted commas. And Christus Victor talks essentially about the cross as the ultimate victory over sin, evil, and death. So it puts that emphasis on turning what might look like the greatest defeat into actually the greatest triumph. So there's an awful lot going on in this very challenging passage. Certainly it calls into question our ideas about aspiration and greatness and what that might actually mean, as well as inviting us to turn very much towards the cross and ponder its significance. It seems fundamentally that James and John didn't want to look in that direction, but that is where Jesus is leading us, towards Jerusalem, towards Calvary. And we need to keep that in mind as we approach our questions for this week.